Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are already 30 plus people in the audience. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are extremely pleased to have you all with us. Uh, we have a very tight agenda. The purpose of this call is to really uh, look through the year, what happened so far this year, and to give you as well an outlook what could ha happen actually next year. Just for your information, this call is going to be recorded so that you can share it with others that could not make it today. Uh, with that, I would like to pass on already uh, to Marcos. Marcos, please. Hello, uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks uh, a lot for joining the call today. So this is basically the plan for the presentation. I'm going to go through the cycle. Where are we in the cycle? Then the classic uh, investment case, Pandora and natural resources. Carlos will deal with technology and energy. And then Urs and Alex will deal with uh, the last parts of the presentation. So let's just start with the, where are we in the cycle? I think it's important to have a base case scenario. So in the basic items we are following in the past few years, COVID-19 looks under control, excluding China. And this is kind of surprising because there is an easy solution to China, which is importing mRNA vaccines. So we think that in the next few months, probably two quarters, uh, China will more or less control the virus. This is the base case. Inflation has peaked in our opinion and will substantially fade. We'll go in detail later on. Regarding the leading indicators we follow now in the current scenario, we still see earning downgrades. We still see inflation and rates uh, peaking, so not yet there. Industrial PMIs are still falling and China is still, you know, in Delta negative in terms of macro means still we don't see the bottom. Uh, and the fifth thing we are following is the war obviously, which is not improving at all. Uh, so basically, we think we are in an ongoing economic downturn, delta negative, probably for the next couple of quart quarters. We think that maybe the bottom will be in Q2, Q3, and this phase of the cycle is normally negative for value and cyclicals, but we are managing the funds on a, on a conservative matter. So in the next slide, you can see a little bit what we think about inflation. There's a sharp correlation, inflation and uh, you know aggregator M2, the, the money that is circulating in the economy. And you can see here how the you know M2 is starting to normalize in, uh, in, the, in the past few years, in two years. So which means that uh, what we expect is inflation to normalize in the next two years. We think that peak inflation is approaching. In Europe, we think it's gonna be the first quarter. And for next year, inflation should be around four to 5%. Commodities and energy are down already. Uh, transport, logistics prices are falling. Mm -hmm. Finished goods are normalizing and we still need to see the services and labor uh, to complete the, the upward movement. So inflation we think is gonna be peaking very soon and, and you know normalizing the next couple of years. Regarding the, ne the, the next topic, which is the, the um, China, Basically on China, what we missed here is the, the COVID-19. So our opinion was that the cycle, the cycle would start to uh, move upwards in the second half of this year, but the lockdowns are preventing the economy to, to launch. I think the important message here is that what we think is that China is not on the verge of an economic crisis. We believe and we are convinced that the government can manage the cycle and they will do it in the next few months. So. There's people out there that are very negative on China. In our opinion, the Chinese the cycle is, is manageable. There's no bubbles here or there and property, COVID and consumer should be manageable. Uh, the country is implementing 900 measures to incentivize the economy. And we think this will slowly pass through to the, to the economy. So basically, in, you know, to conclude a little bit on where are we in the cycle, we are in an economic slowdown. Nobody knows if it is gonna be a recession or not, but it's a slowdown. The portfolios are built to be recession proof. So we are not really uh, worried about that. As you know, we are long-term investors and if shares price, share prices drop, we will buy more because basically short-term doesn't change the fundamentals of the, of the companies. So our strategy of uh, risk categories 
diversification by sectors and geographies is paying off. And we are trying to slowly move to the cheaper uh, parts of the, of the market. So let me repeat uh, one of the famous sentences of Warren Buffett. Be greedy when people are fearful. It's what we are doing slowly, buying on the cheap and changing a little bit the balance of the fund. So, you know, let, let's keep that in mind. Uh, corrections and recessions are a good opportunity uh, to invest money. So that's for the base case, slow down. We are managing it, not an issue. Let me, let's move to the classic. So the classic year to date, it's up uh, 15, 16% uh, because we had a good run also last week. Uh, to mid November, it was up uh, 14%. This is uh, basically better than, than all, in, on all the indices. So we are happy with this performance. Although in the end, it doesn't mean much because as you know, you know, short term, the stock market is a voting machine. So, you know, a year performance is not meaningful, but anyway, it's a very good year for us, uh, more in relative. Best sectors in the classic, aerospace, defense, scattering, cleaning, oil and gas. Worst sectors, tech, healthcare, cement, salmon, and mining. So these, I ask a questions to yourselves. Do you prefer equities to be up or down? So, you know, falling equities is tough. So we need to see the markets and the rates, et cetera. That is a fantastic way to make money because we are buying the same companies much cheaper. So in terms of the intrinsic value of the fund, the last update is uh, 880 euros per share. You know that we do intrinsic value for all the stocks. So this is the average for the fund. The IRR is around 15% uh, at current prices. As we said, we keep rebalancing the fund to buy on the cheap. And now the classic is more or less in uh, the mid-range valuation. So 15% IRR, historically, you know very well, it's been between 12 and 17%. We are launching our target for 22. So the target for this year was a NAV of 575 euros per share for December 22. We are around this level. For next year, we think the fund should be 625, 650 per share. Uh, just a note here, a rough calculation. If we take the expected return, we deduct fees, uh, we still can provide a 13% IRR, which is doubling the investment in the next five years. You know very well that all the team of CI is invested in the funds. So we will uh, fight hard to, to get this, this target done. Let's quickly pass to the slide that I normally put in the presentation. So this is 50% of the classic. You can see it via 10 names. We are talking about the four Gs, good business, good management, good balance sheet, and good value. And all of them, or most of them have this. The only concentration factor of the classic now is energy, which remains a heavyweight around 20%. We are very, very much convinced that oil and gas prices will remain high. And you can look here in 10 names, there's a huge diversification and very good quality. So we are not worried, worried at all about the, the correction or the recession. In the next slide, I want to talk about uh, something that we are losing and we will miss. Devro, one of our stakes, one of our holdings for many years has got a takeover bid. So it's a little sad for us because we lose a friend, but the price offered by the Saria, which is an agri-food company in Holland, is fair in our opinion, 316 pence per share, 60% premium uh, versus the previous close. So as I said, not far from the intrinsic value that we calculate, it's an important uh, impact in the classic because it was a more or less 4% of the classic. It's a minor impact to the natural resources. It was a kind of 2% in the natural resources. And the important thing is that it's not a big change in the upside, but it's a big change in timing because we are accelerating the return, right? So it's going to be, we're going to take this money and invest it in something cheaper. So we are happy to have this impact in the IRR, in the IV, not happy because we are losing a, a good friend here. So let me go fast to the quarterly investment case, which is Pandora. It is surprising because we really claim victory in Pandora uh, in 2021. The stock did very well in the previous two years. Uh, the stock and the company did very, very well. So we were very happy to, to be right on that one. But you know, a year later, the stock is down 50%. So now <laughs> we wanted to highlight this. 
The stock is trading at eight times 2023. Why is it cheap? Well, it's part of the consumer discretionary sector, which is heavily exposed to the cycle, so very cyclical. And the company obviously has a mediocre track record being in the middle of a restructuring with a lot of doubts, right? So Mr. Market, let's put it this way, is very worried about Pandora. And in the next slide, you can see what we think. What we think is that Pandora has significant competitive advantages, scale, costs, distribution, even a little bit of network effect and switching cost, maybe from a commercial perspective, balance sheet is healthy, stock is cheap, management is fantastic. So, you know, it is true, the company is not immune to downturns. So probably next year we have risk of down rates, but the stock is super cheap and we think it's a high quality company. So we started buying, we will come keep, keep buying. And just noting here that the company paid us this year, 15% total yield, including dividends and buybacks, which is really, this is real money. This is real cash flow. Nothing to do with the price, which is again, back to Graham's, the price is a voting machine, right? In our opinion, in our numbers, Pandora, the intrinsic value is around 1200 uh, Danish Krona, the IRR is more than 20%. So we should easily double in the next three to four years. So that's an update I wanted to give you on Pandora, which is doing very poorly. And now let me hand over to Carlos. He's going to talk about technology and energy. Uh, yeah, good morning. Just uh, just a few words. As you all know, of course, uh, markets have uh, corrected this year. The, you have the Standard & Poor's, the uh, stock 600, and the, the world index, all in euro, by the way, because the, the dollar is uh, strongly up. Uh, so to compare things uh, comparable, we put them in euro. They've recovered since uh, the beginning of October, but they're still cheaper than at the beginning of the year. Then the question is, you know, are, are things cheap now? And uh, the answer is that it depends. You may remember uh, that on a previous, uh, let's go to the next slide, on a previous uh, newsletter, we mentioned the, really the absurdity that a company like Zoom, that is the red line there, was worth as much as Exxon. I mean, this is, these are real numbers. <laughs> and this, this happened a year ago. Um, well, uh, things have moved on. And this is uh, the, the chart at the bottom is the same one, only a few more, a few more months. Now Exxon is worth 14 times more than Zoom. So uh, the question is, well, uh, is now technology cheap now and energy uh, too expensive? Or as some people who look at our natural resources fund or even the classic fund, is it too late now to invest in energy? I mean, look at this uh, blue line, too late, I missed it. Well, uh, if we go to the next uh, slide, we see that is, uh, that is not the case. I mean, sorry, this is means for the whole. I mean, this is not just Zoom against the Exxon. This is the whole energy uh, sector in blue against the red uh, technology uh, sector. So, so we see that it is not just Exxon and, uh, and Zoom. So is it uh, now too late to invest in energy? Now, if we go to the next slide, you can see that uh, and this is a very, very, very important slide and people rarely look at things this way. Uh, the, the, the dark columns is the uh, free cash flow that Exxon has had in 2021, is having in 2022. And there uh, we put just the expectation on the analyst. We believe it's going to be higher, but this is what analysts put consensus. So we don't target. Uh, as a percentage of what it costs to buy shares in Exxon. So if you buy a share in Exxon, uh, if you've been the owner of a share in Exxon for 2022, you've got a 12% free, free cash flow. Cash flow means cash, cash flow return. Uh, 12% at a time of you know, interest rates, two, 3%. Um, if you had been the owner of Microsoft shares, which by the way, we believe are a great investment, but you would be getting less than 4% free cash flow. So you can see that the market still does not believe in energy as a good investment or put in different terms. Energy investments are very, very inexpensive. You can get a big, uh, a big, um, return on your investments now. And, and you can see that all over the place. You can have a company like, uh, 
like Uber, who has never made any money, zero, never, uh, even with all the accounting gimmicks that you want. Uh, well, it has a 55 billion US dollar market cap, which is more or less the same market cap that Suncor Canadian Energy has, a company that just produces 700,000 barrels of oil per day and earns about $15 million per day. Um, so that's where we are. So there is no, there has been no reversion to the mean. Obviously, some energy things have gone down, uh, sorry, up. Some uh, technology things have gone down, but this is still big, big, big gap in, in expectations. You can see that in the next slide. I mean, this is kind of anecdotal if you wish, but there is a fund that is well known in the US called ARC, run by a lady called Kathy Woods, which has invested, I mean, it was the, the, the poster boy of the kind of a bubble we have, we've had in technology. She is invested in all the, I mean, actually Zoom is her biggest position, invested in all the fashionable things. You can see the fantastic uh, return it had until it didn't have it. <laughs> now, the wonderful thing is that this lady still has $250 million uh, of inflows last month. As long as that number is positive, the bubble is on, okay? When this thing goes red, then you can say, okay, now people are finally giving up. But you know, the, the people are still make, by the way, of all the companies that she has in her, in her uh, portfolio, the only one that makes a little bit of money is Zoom and then Tesla with some funny, with some funny accounting and then nobody else makes any money, not even on a two year ahead basis, uh, according to the analysts. But people keep putting uh, millions and millions of dollars. So the, this, this, this game is not over yet by any means. Now, if you go to the next slide, you see that what the market is assuming is very different rates of growth. Obviously, market is not stupid. If people pay, I mean, accept 4% return on Microsoft and demand 12% return on Exxon, it is because they do not believe that Exxon is going to continue producing the same 12%. Obviously, if somebody were to sign that you are going to get that 12% forever, well, everybody would buy it and it wouldn't be 12%. Then. And in fact, in fact, if you look at the consensus, uh, free cash flow in absolute terms, it's uh, fascinating by the way that Exxon has almost the same cash flow as Microsoft this year. And the company is worth four times less in the market. And the reason is on the 2023 columns. The market believes that Microsoft, even with a recession and blah, blah, is going to maintain its profitability while everybody believes that Exxon is going down. Now, the profitability of a company like Exxon going down is, can only be due basically to one fact, is the price of oil going down. So the question is, uh, you know, is, there, is uh, energy, are energy prices going to stay up or not? Now, we've argued many times that they are, and the reason is extremely simple. The price is determined by supply and demand. Now, supply of energy is not going up. In fact, it may be going down in many pockets. Uh, and then the demand, contrary to what some people have believed, is not only not going down, it is in fact going up also. Every year there is 100 million more cars on the roads, believe it or not. Even if 10% of them are electric, that means 90 more million cars on the roads every year uh, that have to be uh, you know, powered with, uh, with oil. Uh, so the point is that right now you can buy an energy company, one of the Canadian companies we own, which are huge, uh, with a free cash flow of 20, 25%. That means that in four years time, five years time, you have recovered all your investment and any oil that's still left in the ground is free to you. What it's happening right now is that analysts are giving a value to zero to that oil in the ground. And this is the key issue. If you believe that in 10 years time, oil will have some value, uh, this is a fantastic investment because it is infinitely, infinitely profitable because they're, they are giving it us, they are giving it to us for free. Uh, as this changes, as this uh, zero terminal value that many analysts have put because of the climate change and blah 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 
changes and people start realizing that it does have some value, uh, you are going to see, as we are seeing, this is not a forecast, this is a statement of what is already happening already, we are going to see a correction upwards of the valuation um, of all these companies, and this is a this is a very important uh, this is a very important point. So to summarize, I mean, trying to give some numbers, this big uh, outperformance that we have seen, and that we see in our funds, by the way, of uh, energy over technology is by no means done, and in fact, there is a huge uh, run still uh, to go uh, on both sides. Many many uh, technology companies are still way overpriced and uh, energy uh, technology companies and energy companies are still ridiculously undervalued. Okay, that was my, my point briefly. Okay, so I think I should take over here. Let's go for the natural resources. Uh, so natural resources fund up 20, uh, sorry, 40% in 21. This year it's up, I think the last, last number is 17 percent uh, valuing the the russian stocks that you know very well we own three stocks that are listed and trading but we cannot value them we are our mark to market at zero so you know in two years we've done 60 percent or 665 percent which is basically what we were expecting in terms of sectors energy has been outstanding this year with uh, you know a move of more than 60 percent and the rest of the sectors have been negative, mining negative, infrastructures negative, and agri-food negative. So really a big discrepancy in the performance. In terms of relative terms, we are more or less in line with the Standard & Poor's Natural Resources Index uh, that is up 20% in euros, 90% in dollars. So, you know, we remain convinced that uh, we are in a super cycle. We are convinced that this super cycle will be one of a long duration due to ESG, Russia and fear of peak demand in, in, in oil. You know, oil has a fear of peak demand there that is really impacting new investments. So this is a slide that I normally put in order to see the look through of the investments of the natural resources. Uh, you can see that nothing has really changed. Energy is hard for the fund still. And you know, it has helped a lot the performance this year. And now gradually we are moving a little bit from high or expensive stocks to uh, better names. For instance, copper is very cheap and some oil companies are less cheap, which doesn't mean it's a big change, it's just marginally moving there. So we keep our, you know, four Gs here, good businesses, good management, good balance sheet and good price. And we are adding some other layers in order to find the value or performance. We look for the scarce commodities, we look for safer geographies, in production or near production, no startups and no majors. This is basically the mantra for managing the natural resources. In terms of intrinsic value, we updated the numbers. The intrinsic value as of the third quarter is 207 euros per share. The, the price of the fund now is 140, it's still a good upside. The RRR is 14%. Again, bear in mind that the numbers are calculated on mid cycle. So all the DCFs, and all the convergent numbers for the commodity are calculated in mid cycle. So, you know, we think there's a big upside if we move to the upper end of the cycle. The current, the, the, what we discussed, the, the divergence between energy, which is up a lot this year and mining down, is allowing us to rebalance the fund on the cheap, which is good because sometimes you have everything going up and everything going down, which is more difficult to. To, to make uh, to make money there, but when one sector is up and the other the other one is down, then you, you can rebalance and it's fantastic for the long term. Let me just remind you our target, which is doubling the value of this fund in the next three four years or five. We'll see. Uh, this should be relatively feasible if if our uh, base case is is you know is true. You know long term super cycle. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the valuations of the sector are not yet at mid-cycle. Let me give you a short update on the, on the oil market. Basically, we expect higher prices relatively soon, basically due to the, you know, the cap that Europe, sorry, the G7 wants to put on oil prices in, from Russia. 
and also from the ban of Europe to Russian oil. So this probably will have an impact in supply. And we think that this will more than offset the recession fear. Fundamental issue long term is the same, is supply. Supply is very limited in the next few years. And you have many, many factors under investment for 10 years. US shale, as you know very well, is maturing now. There is financial discipline in the sector. Fear of peak demand in oil. Everybody fears that demand will fall, is not going to fall in the next 10 years. ESG constraints, spare capacity, blah, blah. So there's a lot of fundamental issues in the sector that are going to constrain the supply. So what happens when a market is under supply and is what we think? Uh, well, prices should go to the level that incentivize new projects, okay? And this on a theoretical basis is 80 to $90 per barrel. The problem we have now is that apparently it is not enough because you know you have ESG constraints, so you cannot. Nobody really wants to build a new uh, well or a new uh, deep sea water uh, well because uh, you emit a lot of CO2, and then there is a fear of peak demand here. So these are non-quantitative hurdles for 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 FIDs, right? For for final investment decisions. So this is constraining again investment in the sector. So in our view, higher prices than 80 and 90 are needed, but we are not able to calculate uh, because it's very difficult to convince people to invest in oil. In the next slide, you can see that the market basically backs what I am saying and what Carlos was commenting. If you look at the ratio EV to EBITDA of the sector, with average oil prices not massive, this year is gonna be around 90. Next year, analysts are using around 90 to 100. If the EBITDA is below four times, it's all time low. So this means, and back to what Carlos was saying and what we are saying is that the sector is not really valued. I think uh, the sector or the market expects uh, earnings to go down, uh, oil prices to go down, and earnings you know, to really uh, disappoint. And we are completely uh, convinced of the contrary. So the stock is still very cheap and trading below uh, mid-cycle ranges. We have some negative news here on Salmon. You know very well, we've been very active in Salmon for the last decade. And it was a small position, thanks God, because uh, we were selling a little bit on the highs. So the Norwegian government comes out from the, you know, from I don't know where, and they propose a new tax. That's amazing tax from 30% to 60% only, 40 points of tax. So this is amazing because, you know, in our view, this sector is well managed. It is ESG compliant. It is producing food, which is very efficient. And we don't think that uh, we should kill it. So this is only a proposal. We don't have the final regulation or the final details. So we need to wait to do the, the, the numbers. And there are discussions. So we are optimistic on that front. We didn't sell the shares. So we took a hit, more or less the sector is down 30, 35, 40% from the date that the government announced the, the new tax. And you know, if the resource tax is not changed, the sector will not be as interesting as in the past. It is really a, a regime change because you know, you downgrade the profitability, fundamental will change, employment will change, investments will go down, growth will go down, dividends will go down, et cetera. It's really a big change, a, a, a change of regime. In our view, this is going to be negotiated. This is our real case. We think that the final deal will be more balanced and then we will do our numbers. We will see that it is worth increasing or not. But basically so far we keep our stakes, not a lot of damage. And if the final agreement is positive, we will rebuild a big position here. And I think that's uh, all for the, for the natural resources. Just as a conclusion, the fund is doing fine. 60% in the past two years, we think there's still a lot of upside. Uh, broad, broad picture remains unchanged. Basically the energy transition is provoking a huge increase in demand for green metals, metals and also you know, much constrained development of oil and gas projects as we commented before. The only new thing is Russia this year, which is gonna have an impact. It's a big producer of oil, gas and metals. So it's gonna have a an impact in supply. We remain convinced, convinced of the super cycle, a long one, and valuations are still below the mid cycle. So, you know, this fund should be doing fine in the next, in the next few years. And I think 
uh, I finish my part, I hand over to uh, Urs on animal spirits. Thanks, Marcos. Obviously, as you know, we have a, a very long-term view, but uh, for once, I would like to show some uh, shorter term uh, observations. Obviously, we get uh, asked from time to time if it's a good uh, moment to invest in our fund. So that's uh, obviously a question you should never pose to a fund manager because he always believes it's a good moment to invest in our fund. But I really think uh, we have a buying opportunity which arises uh, every third year or so. And here is a, a little chart which shows the speculative positioning and the commercial positioning in the copper market. So meaning the meaning the, the white line is the is the speculative position. And you see that it's on a such a low level, which happens every third year. The last time was in 19. And usually just statistically, the copper market or the copper price always doubled when you had such an extreme positioning. And we know by this, obviously, the recession and the Dr. Copper, everybody shorts commodities. And this is a, just to explain, very difficult to find a good. Uh, a good, uh, uh, good statistic because you know we only have the oil market and the gold market which has reasonable statistic but speculative and commercial positioning is a bit strange in the gold market because it's not so clear who is really a commercial because if you trade uh, commodities you have to uh, you have to file yourself at the exchange what you are exactly a hedge fund a cta and so on and what it means if the commercial have a long position as i will show later it means that it's cheaper to source metal hypothetically from the financial sellers than, than from the market physically. And this is a very dangerous situation for shorting commodities. And just a little uh, anecdote, I remember some 20 years ago, due to whatever reason, people were having similar position in cocoa futures, where 70% of the supply comes from the Ivory, Ivory Coast. And then you had some troubles in the Ivory Coast. And then the market was up, uh, limit up every day for, I think, nearly two weeks and copper cocoa price is doubled and you could not even cover the shorts because the problem here is in, in commodity futures you really have a physical end market of a customer who needs the stuff so nestle and cocoa or a cable manufacturer won't shy away because the price is getting too high or too low it just needs the stuff and the financial speculants will never be able to deliver uh, physical metal and uh, we think that it's a very good indication what is going to happen. And uh, maybe on the next slide, Alex, we see something similar in the oil market. We have one of the lowest uh, long positions from the financial industry for the last, uh, whatever, 10 years. And on the next slide, Alex, we see also a huge uh, impact we had from the, from the strategic petroleum reserves, which have been sold down to a, a low, one of the low or the lowest level in 40 years now. And this is uh, stated officially by the White House to bring inflation down. Obviously, we had this election, and it's also officially stated they will have to rebuild it. So we have seen in the last uh, six to nine months probably the worst headwinds for our markets you can have, meaning everybody is anticipating the recession, the financial industry is shorting, the strategic petroleum surface being sold, China has still be, been on the lockdowns, and Therefore, it's quite amazing that you have such high uh, commodity prices. And we could see next year some of these headwinds going away because the interest rate cycle is probably peaking. Uh, the strategic petroleum surf will be rebuilt. The financial industry will have to cover. And uh, this could be quite uh, explosive for our market. Some of our friendly com competitors, uh, which I which I read, which I think is very well informed, he expects oil prices of 200 box in six months so obviously we would not make such a prediction but i can assure you that these markets will be very very tight next year and maybe on the next slide i just have a few headlines which is completely different if you look to physical markets than what the financial industry is anticipating and if somebody has read uh, the the books of uh, the commodity traders and so on i think there's a funny anecdote that even historically the the, the, the secret services tended to talk to the march mark rich of this world because they wanted to know the state of the economy and you know it's not the case that this physical market is not reading the newspapers neither and doesn't know does not know that the market is discounting a recession and what usually happens is that you know, through the whole supply chain, the inventories are being reduced. And as you know, a lot of the heavy industries, for example, in Europe, they even shut down 
more due to the to the energy costs. But you know, if if such a recession is anticipated, everybody reduces the inventory. You know, where, let's say the, the the construction industry buys less cables, so the the cable producer buy buys less uh, less uh, copper. The the smelter buys less ore, or even particularly it's, it's, if it's being shut down. So we have a situation going to next year where this whole inventory level in the physical market is already very very low and you see a few uh, a few headlines here that we have record record physical premiums already for metal and this means this means that uh, it's a uh, cheap because the physical premiums are really the physical premiums you pay on uh, in addition to the three months lme contracts and we see already which is very surprising in such an environment that the market has problems to source physical stuff. And this is in the biggest, uh, you know, anticipation of one of the biggest recessions, interest rate and so on. So I think this is very, very uh, interesting situation going into the next year. And maybe uh, just the last funny headline. Uh, I tend to have some uh, some uh, of these uh, of these front pages back to me on the wall. One is, uh, one is uh, inflation is dead. The other one, Credit Suisse, will become a new partners group. And maybe this one is also something to add to the wall because the US dollar is one of the most or probably the most crowded trade at the moment. And I will hang up this, uh, this front uh, pages afterwards and we will see what's going to happen in the next two or three years if really the US dollar will be such a good investment when you buy today compared to copper, gold, oil, stocks and so on. Thanks, Alex. That's from my side. Thanks a lot, Urs. With that, actually, I would like to, to come to the conclusion. Uh, if you look at this very long-term chart, uh, basically since the Second World War in 1945, you see along this red line, this clear, very nice, very long-term outperformance of value over growth. And you basically see the last phase, which has been really uh, the phase where where actually the situation was that it was a, really a blip. So that, I think, with that, the situation is really clear for us. Uh, we strongly believe that the situation for value is by far not over. It has basically just started. So basically, that is our conclusion. And we actually want to show what that actually currently means for the classic. We show on this chart, as uh, old listeners, you have seen this chart several times. We talk about this look through profitability of the classic fund. Of course, time passes, and we are now looking at the year 23. And you see that our valuations here measured very simply on the Bloomberg average mean estimates. Uh, the classic is trading actually with a PE below 10, with a dividend yield of 3.4 and the price of book of 1.6. And you see it on all the metrics, substantially cheaper with a nice discount over the market. So we strongly believe that we are all really in for a very, very nice return over the next 10 years. Now, the past 20 years, uh, soon is gonna be the 21st uh, anniversary of the fund in January. Uh, we basically delivered 8.7%. And you see that relative to MSCI world and MSCI value, we have done pretty, pretty well. And what I would like to stress here again is the fact that relative to our situation in 2008, our learning of these four risk categories has really changed the picture in this COVID correction in the sense that we were able to sell category ones and twos that did extremely well and were able to rebalance the portfolio in the trough. So we strongly believe we have learned a lot from the 2008 example. And we think we have a nice positioning going forward because we argue that the value years have just started. Now, if we now look at the performance since we came up with these four risk categories, we basically delivered the 10% that which is our new goal. Uh, a couple of months ago, we have received a new request from a from a US pension fund that is basically looking at investments outside of the US because they have a lot of good value managers in the US, but they basically are trying to find 
managers that would be willing to run a mandate MSCI World XUS. And for that, he requested from us to bring all the details back to him in an Excel format with all the icing codes that are not US icing codes, all the positions every month from Pick Day, our custodian bank. And basically, if you were looking at this chart, then if you have all this data, you can plug in Bloomberg. If you're looking at this chart, you'll see a very nice steady outperformance. And of course, the correction in COVID, but then a very nice bounce. I must be fair. I mean, this uh, chart is done before cost, but you basically see that we were able to beat MSCI World XUS with our portfolio XUS by almost 80, 80% plus. And the last chart uh, that I wanted to show you here is basically this chart from the Net Resources Fund relative to the S&P Net Resources Index since the COVID trough, because we argue the fund is high beta, yes, but if we have a situation of a new commodity cycle ahead of us that we argue, we believe the Net Resources Fund is a perfect puzzle to basically own. Uh, with that, we are actually uh, already pretty much on time. Uh, we would like to conclude, but we already have received the first question on, on the chat. Part of that was already answered by Marcos, but there is an add-on question. The question was basically on the salmon situation. To be straight to the point, I mean, our salmon position, we have lucky enough this time reduced in August before the tax happened in the two funds to barely three and a half percent. So basically the correction that was hitting us on the salmon market was not as bad as it could have been because you all know that we have been much, much higher position in salmon. But why were we so low uh, in August? And we were cutting because in our view, the valuation were reaching some of the targets. Now there was an add-on question. And uh, if you then want to have further questions, just please, go in the chat and send it to us. But there was an add-on question and I would like to ask Marcos that. What about the other taxes in, uh, let's say in oil, uh, windfall taxes in the UK? How do you see that, Marcos? Yeah, I mean, this one was more expected. Uh, thanks for the question. So we were, and we are expecting taxes in oil and gas and in commodities, because this is a normal behavior of the government uh, during the upturn. So this was more or less expected, first comment. Second comment, what they do not understand is that this sector, the governments or the politicians, they do not really understand two things. First, that this is not a windfall profit. Basically, <laughs> the oil sector, the gas sector, and the metals, they are, they are volatile, they, they say, you know, it's a cycle. So they make money during five, six years, then they lose money during five, six years. What they shouldn't do is when the sector loses money, you do nothing. And when the sector makes money, you take the money off, right? I mean, this is completely wrong. This is the first comment. It's a wrong understanding of the sector, which is cyclical. And the second comment is that, now we are in a phase where we need to incentivize the world needs to incentivize investment in oil because we need oil because as carlos was saying 65% uh, of the demand of oil comes from transport and transport is still very much uh, driven by by fossil fuels so we need to invest and if the government and politicians they implement taxes then uh, capex is going to be down and if capex is down then prices of the commodities will move up because there's no supply so that's our view. In our view, it's a big mistake. And in the end, you know, this in the end, for for instance, for harbor energy that we own in the fund, uh, we will put uh, higher prices of oil in the next few years that will compensate for these higher taxes. So the impact is not that big. And uh, in the end, it's the wrong thing to do because uh, harbor energy, it's a big investor in the UK. And the UK wants to be independent or independent in fossil fuels. And now, you know, they disincentivize the main producer. So it's, it's a big mistake in our opinion. Thanks a lot, Marcos. Basically, we have uh, also received another question here on, on, on my email. Uh, that would be for, for Carlos. I mean, the question is more on the strategic positioning of an oil company. Uh, Carlos, may, you may want to explore a bit on that. 
how can it be really uh, unique uh, if you if you if you look at oil companies yeah well no all companies are no, not unique in the sense that you know they produce a commodity which by definition is a non differentiated product now where would the, the extra profitability of an oil company uh, come from obviously uh, repeat not from uniqueness but from the fact that supply is not enough to accommodate demand. Now, in the real world, over the long term, that balances out. So, but you have many long periods in which that does not happen because supply takes a very long time to catch up with demand. To, you know, when people want SPACs like they did last year, well, it takes a while, but in a few months, uh, Wall Street generates 500 SPACs. Now, now people want uh, natural gas, but nobody can generate 500 natural gas fields in six months. You know, it takes a very, very long time. Now, you take a look at the reserves. Most oil companies, and this is something that somebody mentioned to me like 25 years ago, and it was a shock to hear it, but most oil companies are short oil. They don't really have that much oil. They make, I mean, they they explore for oil, produce it and sell it. But as they sell it, obviously they deplete their fields and they have to keep looking for oil. If for some reason they do not find new reserves, either, either because they cannot find them or because they're not even looking for them, which is the case right now, they don't want to invest, then oil disappears. So the company that has reserves like Canadian companies, which have reserves proven on the ground for the next 50 years at least, have a unique position. Nobody else has that. Uh, so it's not uniqueness in the sense of the, uh, differentiation of the product, but it is uniqueness or strategic position in which you have a commodity that people need, and it is not going to be abundant for a very long time, for the reasons we have already discussed. Maybe to, to add what is maybe an interesting comparison around 15 years ago, you also had a strategic repositioning of German utilities, for example. And this is exactly the same situation. Most of them are at the end are being short energy because they are on the spot and have fixed prices. So despite a, a massive rise of, a utility, of a power prices in Germany, you know, it was not such a good sector for many to be in as they are virtually bankrupt, as le at least many of them. And if uh, large oil companies are redirecting and selling actively their oil business, maybe that's not the best thing to, to own in the next 10 years if you're really expecting strong oil prices. Thanks, Thanks a lot. There was actually another question on the timing of Pandora, basically, uh, how was our positioning? Uh, if uh, it's okay, Marcos, I take that. I mean, uh, we have been heavily buying when uh, Pandora fell in the last basically crisis. It fell down to 250. We it became the largest position in the fund. And then in the rebound that uh, Marcus was commenting, we sold quite a bit. So we sold the position down, I think, to two and a half percent. And then this year it dropped again with this recession fear. And as Marcus added, uh, we were steadily uh, building the position again because we strongly believe what Carlos mentioned. Uh, if there would be no additional questions from the audience, uh, I think we can easily conclude here because uh, we are extremely happy to have so many listeners. Uh, in the peak, there were 65 people in the audience today. And like always, uh, we recorded and we have recorded it and it will put it on the web together as well with the PowerPoint presentation in PDF format. So with that, I see there are no new questions. We would wish you a very good end of the year and we would be great to have you in a physical conversation at the table. Please, you see all the details here on the last slide. Please don't hesitate to contact us uh, Urs, Marcos, Carlos, or me, we will be very happy to go into direct conversation with you. Take care and have a good end of the year and a great start in 2023. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, hello. Hello. Thanks. Bye.